Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here today. My name is Magnus Lofstrom, and I'm a senior fellow and the policy director of criminal justice here at the Public Policy Institute of California. Welcome to, to today's program, Policing in California. Today, we're going to feature uh, presentations on two new PPIC reports. I will first share the uh, findings from our report, Racial Disparities in Law Enforcement Stops, and then my colleague Deepak Prem Kumar will present the findings from our report on police use of force and misconduct in California. I want to acknowledge and thank Arnold Ventures for their support for uh, of today's events. And I've been asked to read the following uh, disclaimer as well. As a public charity, PPIC does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. So following our presentations, our colleague Brandon Martin uh, will join us to moderate audience uh, Q&A. And if you have any questions about either of the report at any time, please send an email to the address on your screen and include your name and organization with your question. That is ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Uh, All right, so with that, we're gonna move on to our presentations. And well, let's do this. So, um, we're going to start off with the, the, uh, the uh, presentation on racial disparities in law enforcement stops. This is a report that is co-authored with uh, Brandon Martin, Joe Hayes, and Deepak Prem Kumar. And I also want to acknowledge and, and thank Arnold Ventures for funding for this work. So one of California's and the nation's most pressing criminal, uh, uh, criminal justice issue are, are really um, the stark racial disparity that we observe. And this is most notable between black and white residents. And really at the center of these recent concerns, as well as reform efforts is policing and especially use of force. And it's important that these uh, uh, policy discussions are informed by data and research in order to identify strategies for safely reducing disparities. So what we're going to do here today is share with you some key findings from these two reports. For the first one, uh, we examine differences across race and ethnicity in interactions and experiences with law enforcement. And we, in the second report that Deepak will uh, present, we assess limitations and we examine existing data on police use of force and misconduct. Uh, so here is the uh, racial disparities in law enforcement stop. And um, thanks to the 2015 um, Racial and Identity Profiling Act, uh, California is really at the forefront of collecting police stop data. And it began in 2018 with the uh, largest law enforcement agencies. And by 2023, all law enforcement agencies will collect and report to the State Department uh, data on all vehicle and pedestrian stops. And so it's important to um, clarify what a stop is given the uh, RIPA definition. A stop is any detention of a person by a police officer or any officer inter interaction in which the officer conducts a search of that individual. And so what we're doing here in this report is we examine close to 4 million stops conducted in 2019 by the state's 15 largest law enforcement agents. That includes the CHP, eight police departments, and six uh, sheriff's departments. And these data include information, both in demographic information, as well as information about the context of this stop. And the context include, for example, the reason for, for the stop. Was it a traffic violation? Was it for reasonable sus suspicion? Or possibly uh, for an arrest warrant? It also contains information about the actions taken by the officers. These could include uh, whether the person was searched, any contraband was found, and other actions as well that I'll talk a little bit more about shortly. We also have information about enforcement. So whether a citation was issued, uh, warning was issued, or even if the individual was booked into jail. The demographic information is all as perceived by the officer, 
and it's also reported after the stop. It's important to keep that in mind. So what we do here is uh, we examine disparities in a variety of stop outcomes to create a better understanding of what those experiences are. So we look at, uh, we start off by looking at the likelihood of an individual being searched during a stop. And we also look at then, well, given that the person was being searched, what is the likelihood that the officer discovers any contraband or evidence, including weapons, property, and, and drugs? Um, we also look at the likelihood of various levels of enforcement um, ranging from no enforcement all the way up to uh, being booked into jail. And importantly, um, we are also examining um, the experiences uh, from the perspective of the intrusiveness of the action and whether some use of force uh, was uh, used in this particular stop. And the intrusiveness of action ranges from being asked to step out of the vehicle to something like handcuffed or if the stop involved an officer's weapon. And what we're focusing both on the report and certainly here in the, uh, in the presentation today is really the differences between black and white Californians, because this is where we see the, the biggest disparity. But it's also important to, uh, to note that the report includes analysis of racial disparities across additional groups as well. So the question is, if we're observing disparities in the types of outcomes and experience that we're looking at, what does that represent then? Well, I think it's uh, very useful to start by recognizing that there's really a broad body of research that finds uh, consistent evidence of bias in many occupations and settings. And that includes anything from the labor markets to housing markets to financial markets. And also research, research has found bias in, in the criminal justice system as well as policing. So bias is one possibility. But other factors may also explain differences in stop experiences. And some of these are included in the REPA data. So for example, whether there is contraband visible to the officers, we would expect that a situation where an officer is observing and sees a weapon, that that stop will look quite different than if there is no contraband evident, evidence uh, evident to the officer in that particular stop, holding everything else constant. Uh, if the officer observes suspicious behavior, uh, we would expect that to have an impact holding everything else constant. So for example, a traffic stop uh, might uh, simply be a verbal uh, communication exchange between the officer and the individual stop. A stop for a reasonable suspicion is likely to look quite different as is one if an in individual uh, has an outstanding warrant for their arrests. And then importantly, there are also differences across jurisdictions and geography as well. So the jurisdictions meaning also that the type of agency matters because there are different missions uh, and objectives of those uh, agencies. Uh, it is also that policing is likely to differ across the various agencies, depending on policing strategies, but also depending on crime challenges. So what we're trying to do here is move us towards more of an apples to apples comparison in the, the differences in the kinds of experience individuals have with law enforcement. But we adjust for differences in plausible factors and contexts across these racial, racial groups. So we use statistical tools. We use regression models to estimate differences for an individual of a given age, gender, and context and adjusting for agency level differences to move us towards that closer of the apples to apples comparison. So we adjust for those factors. But it's important to also note that as, as the data do not capture all relevant factors and they're reported by officers, um, estimates shouldn't be viewed as being causal and they, they do not necessarily represent estimates of police bias. We still find this being very useful as it points us uh, towards the role of these contexts and factors, and also in areas where uh, there is particularly a large uh, disparity as well. So what I'm gonna do next is share with you 
some figures that uh, shows you the uh, racial disparity in the various outcomes that uh, we are examining in this report. And what I'm starting off with here is the likelihood of being searched. So the bar here, this orange bar here represents the difference in the likelihood of being searched during a stop between a black and a white individual. So in this case, that is a uh, 12 percentage point difference. That is that black individuals are 12 percentage points more likely to be searched than white individuals. It's about 20% of all stops of blacks are lead to search where it's 8% for whites. It's a very notable uh, disparity. And then each of these subsequent columns here represents what those estimates of the uh, uh, disparity and the gaps are once we make adjustments for the various factors and context. And what we see here is that the disparity is reduced uh, somewhat when we make adjustments for demographics, for example, age and gender. When we make further uh, adjustments for the context of the stop measured by the reason for the stop, we see also a notable decrease in that disparity. And then lastly, when we adjust for those differences across jurisdictions and agencies, we see a further notable drop in the disparity, where it drops to about four percentage point compared to the 12 percentage point we observe. So these, these factors and context certainly matters, but still we're seeing notable uh, disparity here. This tells us that black individuals, even after all these adjustments are one and a half times more likely to be searched than white Californians. If we move on to looking then at, well, what do these uh, searches yield? And what are the differences in the likelihood of the officer finding some contraband or evidence between uh, searches of black and white individuals? And what we observe here is that it's lower. The likelihood the officer actually finds contraband and evidence on Black individuals is lower than it is of searches of white individuals. It's not a very big difference. In about 20% of searches, officers find contraband, but in about 0.5 percentage point fewer searches of Black individuals do they find, <clears throat> excuse me, contraband. Interestingly, we find as we're making these adjustments for demographics, for the context, the various contexts, we also added in here the basis for the search, as well as the uh, jurisdiction, we find that these uh, disparities increases and that it's about two percentage point less likely to find contraband and evidence in searches of black individuals compared to white. So about a 10% uh, lower discovery rate in searches of uh, black individuals compared to whites. We switch our focus to the enforcement side. What we see is that in the vast majority of stops, there's some sort of enforcement if we measure that uh, by at least a warning being issued. Uh, but we also notice that there is big racial uh, disparity in, in enforcement as well. And what I'm focusing on here is, is whether there was no enforcement, there wasn't even an, a warning issued that likelihood and differences between black and, black and white individuals. And what we see is that in there is, the gap is about 10 percentage points between black and white individuals. That is that in about 20% of stops of black individuals, there is not, no enforcement. There's not even a warning issued. That's about 10% for white individuals. As, as before, we're seeing that as we are making adjustments, statistical adjustments for various factors, demographics and contacts and jurisdictions, that all of these matter and the disparity is less once we have made those adjustments. Still, there's notable equity, inequities. Uh, lastly, we are, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of the findings around intrusiveness and for a variety of measures of intrusiveness. This is if the person was at least asked to step out of a vehicle, assuming then that it's a vehicle stop, uh, to being handcuffed, and then also whether a weapon involved, something we'll hear more about from Deepak shortly. But what we see in all of these uh, 
uh, figures here and for all the measures of intrusiveness that we look at is that black Californians are more likely than white to experience greater intrusiveness. But we also see that the context really does matter uh, here as well. We see that those disparities when we make, once we make those adjustments uh, decreases notably, but again, there's still disparity. The last figure I wanna show you is breaking this out by CHP and local law enforcement. Local law enforcement, uh, police and sheriff department and CHP have different missions. Where CHP, uh, CHP's mission is primarily one of keeping our highways safe. Um, so when we break these out, what we see is that the black white gaps are greatest in the traffic stops that are made by local law enforcement agencies. So I'm gonna show here uh, those gaps in search and discovery rates for traffic violations, as well as reasonable suspicion. So what we see here is that in the likelihood of being searched by police and sheriff department, the likelihood of being searched is 13 percentage point greater for blacks compared to whites in those searches in those stops of uh, local law enforcement for, for traffic violations. We don't see this little bar here represents what that is for CHP. Uh, not much of a disparity there. When we look at stops that are made for reasonable suspicion, we see also that there is disparity where black individuals who stop for reasonable suspicion are more likely to be searched than white individual. It's about nine percentage points. So we do observe disparity there, but this stands out even more because it's relatively rare that someone is being searched during a traffic stop. And we also see here that the discovery rate is not greater the discovery rate, what I mean by that is that the search yielded some contraband evidence. In fact, what we're seeing is that it's lower, notably lower in those stops for traffic violations made by uh, local law enforcement. So in some, just to sum up what we are, uh, what we have just seen here, it's that the RIPA data shows notable racial inequities in law enforcement interactions. Um, and it's police by uh, racial bias may contribute to these inequities, but other factors are, are relevant. The context, the type of agency and jurisdictions do matter as well. But even if we are, after we have made adjustments for these, inequities remain uh, in all of the outcomes that we have looked at here. And importantly, we find that the greatest disparities are in traffic stops made by police and sheriff's departments. So, Concluding here, the, uh, what we uh, find is that this type of data-driven research can inform uh, discussions uh, of and efforts to reduce racial disparity in policing. So firstly, what it shows us is that it shows support for the concerns that are historically voiced by communities of color about inequities. It also shows that some of those disparities may be driven by the officer challenges and, and responsibilities with making stop. Secondly, it shows that we have these lower discovery rates and higher shares of stops that do not lead to enforcement. And that points towards a disproportionate share of unproductive stops of Blacks. And given that we're finding that this is, the disparity is greatest in traffic stops, especially those made by local, local law enforcement, uh, it suggests that we should take a close look at uh, determining to what extent can we actually reduce those kind of stops and maybe especially for non-moving violations and look for alternative ways of enforcing uh, those particular violations. And we think that's very important because a closer examination could reduce risks and injuries to both officers and citizens and reduce racial uh, disparity. So let's see here. With that, I'm gonna wrap up and I wanna remind you again to uh, submit your questions to PPIC event questions at gmail.com. And I now invite my colleague Deepak Prem Kumar to uh, present the findings from his report. Take it away, Deepak. Thanks, Magnus. Thanks everyone for attending. Look forward to presenting 
our PPIC project on police use of force and misconduct. It is co-authored with Alexandria Gums and Shannon McConville, colleagues of PPIC, as well as Renee Xia from UCSF. Now, when we discuss these topics, we're discussing something that's been in the public sphere. Um, in the last one and a half years, there's been a renewed focus on police use of force and misconduct, largely driven after the murder of George Floyd and the protests that followed. But in California, there's been legislation aimed at police accountability and transparency over the last decade, and particularly over the last six years. Now, importantly, because we're talking about these two topics, I want to directly address that use of force is not the same as police misconduct. And use of force has no implications on whether the particular use of force was justified. And in fact, most cases of um, force are legally and procedurally justified. However, we still think it's important to um, talk about use of force more broadly to get a full accounting of civilians that are injured in police interactions, particularly those of unarmed civilians, which may reduce trust in law enforcement. Now, Magnus covered one legislation that occurred in 2015, the um, Racial and Identity Profile Act that provided um, lots of data transparency around police stops. I'd like to cover another, which is Assembly Bill 71, which was passed in 2015. And it mandated um, the reporting of all serious use of force incidents and all firearm discharges, regardless of whether it's on or off duty. Now, this project aims to understand how well this data set um, captures information on police use of force. And we'll be comparing it with other DOJ data sets, as well as information gleaned from hospital visits and crowdsourced deaths on civilian deaths during police encounters. We'll use these data sets and comparisons to quantify how much police use of force is occurring in California, as well as how much police misconduct. And then what are the associated contextual factors for these incidents? Are there any racial disparities in these spaces? And what is the quality of the underlying data? And can we provide suggestions on how to improve it? Now, I already discussed the California DOJ's use of force data. When looking at civilian deaths from police interactions, we can also make comparisons to another California DOJ data set called deaths in custody, we'll be, where we'll be focusing on arrest-related deaths. We'll, be making additional comparisons to a crowdsourced data set that's publicly available online called Fatal Encounters. Now, Fatal Encounters is a data set that was created with journalists and researchers that engaged um, and collected data through Freedom of Information Act requests, web scraping, paid researchers, and various crowdsourcings from communities. When focusing on non-fatal and serious injuries, we'll be comparing the use of force data to information we have on hospital visits. And these medically coded hospital visits are entered when there's an external cause of injury. And these external cause of injury codes have um, a tag related to police use of force. When discussing police misconduct, um, generally the data is more limited. Um, but we'll be focusing on a public data set on the arrests of police officers. Now, what we find using these three data sets is about 195 civilians die in police encounters each year. And this is primarily um, from the fatal encounters data. So this is a figure of um, the number of civilian deaths on the vertical axis as well as trying to map out how these change over time from 2016 to 2019. And we're making comparisons between the two California DOJ data sets, deaths in custody and the use of force data compared to what we see in the fatal encounters data. Now, as you can see from the, the figure, about 70% of the deaths in fatal encounters are present in government sources. And this is, an, um, primarily due to underreporting, it's primarily due to differences in reporting requirements. For example, um, vehicle deaths 
which are about 17% of um, the deaths in fatal encounters. These are deaths related to pursuits from car chases or vehicle accidents. Um, they're undercounted in deaths in custody and they're virtually non-existent in use, the use of force data. And these are primarily because the use of force data does not have it within the scope of the data set. Now, all three of the data sets have gunshot wounds as the leading cause of death. And importantly, e even though the use of force data mandates that all firearm discharges be included, the fatal encounter still has about 8% um, more gunshot deaths than the other two data sets. Now, we need to understand the broader context that's associated with these serious use of force incidents. And a vast majority of these fatalities and gunshot injuries, the civilian that was involved was armed. That's about 80%. So what this figure provides is the share of incidents on the vertical axis, as well as three different subsets of the use of force data. There's the all deaths, all gunshot injuries, as well as the all deaths and gunshot injuries. And what we can glean from this figure is for both all deaths and all gunshot injuries, about 80% of civilians are armed. When expanding to all serious injuries, including deaths, we see that that number drops down to about um, 44%, or put differently, 54%, 56% of those in serious use of force incidents involve an unarmed civilian. And these are the ones that are likely to generate the public scrutiny and potentially damage trust in law enforcement. So in, we really need to understand more about these incidents in the future. Another important context to keep in mind is what is the initial contact reason for these use of force incidents? And primarily it's driven by calls for service. Now, this is just when a civilian typically calls 911 or a non-emergency number of the police department. And importantly, what we see from this use of force data is across all subsets of the data, the all deaths, all gunshot injuries, or all serious injuries, we see that calls for service are um, most prominent. And these typically are more urgent and officers have less discretion. The next most common contact reason is crimes in progress. And similar to calls for service, these are typically higher threat environments for an officer. So it's not surprising that these are um, disproportionately represented in the use, serious use of force incidents. However, 15% um, of Serious use of force incidents involve a vehicle or a pedestrian stop, which can be dangerous, but are more often lower risk interactions, as many of them are generated by traffic violations, where a non trivial share are for equipment and non moving violations. And as Magnus presented, since these are typically the interactions that give rise to racial disparities, and officers may have more discretion. Um, this may be a place to examine um, potential ways to reduce um, serious use of force incidents. And in fact, there are a few municipalities that are working to reduce reliance on traffic stops currently, or on the extreme end, even allocate them to a non-police agency. Another important facet of these serious use of force incidents are behavioral health conditions. Now, what we see when we compare both hospital data and the use of force data is that over four in 10 serious use of force incidents involve a behavioral health issue. Now, the focus on this is the share of non-fatal gunshot injuries. The reason we focus on non-fatal gunshot injuries is because there are few deaths recorded in the hospital data because many die in transit. Additionally, it might be harder to diagnose a behavioral health issue um, when someone has died. So importantly, across both the use of force data and the hospital data, we see similar percentages for both um, police perceiving behavioral health issues and doctors and primarily emergency room doctors um, identifying and diagnosing these same issues. 
So if we think of these non-mutually exclusive buckets, we see um, substance use disorders, which is um, alcohol or drug use, um, having being represented most prominently, about 20 28% of these incidents involve some sort of substance abuse, while 26% involve some sort of uh, mental health issue. Now, for some context, using the stop data, um, we see only 1% of civilians stopped are perceived as having mental health issues. So this is a substantial overrepresentation in serious use of force incidents. Now, the California legislature has addressed this or is trying to address this by passing um, uh, legislation to provide pilot grants to um, uh, community-based organizations to transition their emergency response services to address mental health and substance use crises through non-police channels. Now, finally, um, a big part of the discussion around police use of force is racial disparities therein. Now, what we find is that Black individuals are overrepresented in police use of force incidents. Relative to population, Blacks are about three times more likely to be involved in a serious use of force incident, a gunshot, or a fatality. That's about 6% of California's population and about 18% of those individual incidents. When compared to the number of stops, as Magnus pointed out, um, Black um, people are disproportionately stopped. So they're about 16% of the stop share. This gap is much smaller. And what this reveals to us is reducing racial disparities um, may involve reducing law enforcement contact in the first place. Now, when this figure, what this figure shows is an analysis similar to what Magnus presented in his um, work on racial disparities in law enforcement stops. And what it is, is a regression. Um, it's, it's a figure that shows a regression analysis. And this is showing controlling for being stopped by a police officer. What is the percentage difference in the likelihood of being involved in an incident where an officer points their firearm or discharges their firearm? Now, comparing, these are all the four different racial groups that we had presented in the report. We'll be focusing on Black individuals. Now, what we see is um, Black individuals are about 220% more likely to be involved in these firearm incidents. Now, uh, again, this is a low base rate, so this doesn't happen that often, but when it does happen, black individuals are disproportionately involved about 3.2 times. But when we control for a variety of dem demographic characteristics, the reason for stop, whether a weapon was found on the civilian or the law enforcement agency, that 220% difference reduces to about 64%. So these contextual factors do make a difference in explaining disparities, but as you can see, these racial disparities exist for all racial groups, but most prominently for Black Californians. Now, again, as we transition to police misconduct, I do wanna reiterate that most cases of police use of force are not misconduct. They're often procedurally and legally justified. And in fact, uh, most misconduct is not necessarily related to use of force at all. It could be related to um, dishonesty, obstruction of justice, driving under the influence. However, um, it's still important to understand police misconduct as a phenomenon if we work to address it. Now, information on police misconduct is a bit more limited. There's no official um, data set from the Department of Justice, for example. And it's hard to use um, data sets on civil suits, arrests, or firings, since these are all high bars for law enforcement, since legal work has shown that police officers have additional civil, criminal, and employment protections for their job. In other states, people use um, data on police decertifications. But before October of this year, California was one of three states without a decertification process. And Senate Bill 2 has currently provided that now, and we're currently in the process of creating one. However, um, although we are focused on arrests of police officers in this project, we still think it's informative to glean what we can understand about this 
as well as create a framework on what a public misconduct data set could look like. Now, what this um, Stinson data set looks like on uh, police misconduct um, is that in terms of looking at the most common reason officers are arrested in California, assault seems to be the most typical reason. So the left-hand side of this table is the total number of arrests broken down by offense type. And then the right-hand side is official capacity arrests. And this involves arrests that are um, conducted when it's on duty or an officer identifies themselves as law enforcement. Now, what we see is assault is the most common offense. These numbers are related to data from 2007 to 2016, so over a 10 year period. So on average, there's about 80 officers that are arrested per year. And this is relative to 78,000 peace officers in California. So about 0.1% of officers are arrested annually. And as you can see from the most common arrest types from both total and official capacity, um, a majority are related to sex or violent crimes. Now, Senate Bill 2 and Senate Bill 16 will add to this data transparency effort. And finally, what are some recommendations we can take from this? A big recommendation from the report is improving existing data. And we want to see the use of force data to encapsulate vehicle-related serious injuries and deaths. We also wanna see the California DOJ compose a database on police misconduct. As California passes additional legislation related to use of force and misconduct, such as deadly force standards or initiatives to reduce um, traffic stops or pilot programs for mental health, it'll be incredibly important to evaluate reforms on their effect on police use of force, public space, safety, and racial disparities. And with that, I'm going to transition to the audience question and answer portion of the event. And if it, you do have a question on either presentation, it's not too late, um, please send it to the email on the screen. That's ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. And I will now invite Magnus and I'll introduce Brandon Martin, a research associate in criminal justice who will be moderating our Q&A. Thank you, Deepak. Um, we have a, a number of good, good questions, but there, we have about 23 minutes, so please do continue to send in your questions. I would like to start with Magnus. This is a question from Dan Lindheim at the Goldman School of Public Policy. He asks, in many jurisdictions, pol police routine, routine, routinely search people on probation slash parole because they can. Most people on probation slash parole are people of color, primarily Black. To what extent does that lead to more searches of African-Americans and also might explain the lower hit rate from those searches? Well, that's a great uh, question. Uh, so we, in our analysis, uh, you know, it, it revealed some information around that question. One, uh, one is uh, you're absolutely correct that uh, uh, African-Americans are overrepresented among those who reported to be on parole or probation in the stop data. So that is true. Uh, and we also do find that if uh, individuals who are on parole and probation are much more likely to be searched than, for example, if you stop for a traffic violation or even for reasonable suspicion. So it's definitely something that contributes to, um, to the highest search rate. Uh, the specific extent to how much it explains of that. We haven't looked at that yet, but that's certainly something that we're interested in doing and that we'll probably uh, take a closer look at uh, too. Um, we, we are finding though that uh, in terms of the uh, discovery rate, uh, that it's not a very notable impact on that. I, I, if I recall it correctly, there's even a slightly higher discovery rate uh, of those individuals who are on parole and probation. Uh, so it's most likely if it's gonna have a notable impact and be a notable contributor to what we are seeing here, it's really on the likelihood of being searched. Thanks. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, now turning to Deepak. Deepak, we have a question from Julie Sally with the Senate Office of Research. And she's wondering, when you say the civilian is armed, does that mean with a gun or does it mean any kind of weapon? And if it's any kind, do you have a breakdown by the type of weapon? 
Yes, Julie, that's a great question. And there is a breakdown in the appendix of our report, but primarily when we're talking about armed, we're talking about um, dangerous weapons broadly. So about 50% of these incidents involve a firearm and about five to 8% of those also, in addition to those 50% involve a firearm replica. So a majority of these are related to firearms. Um, and then the broken down after that, it's primarily knives um, and then blunt objects. So typically firearms, but not always. Thank you, Deepak, and thank you for that question, Julie. Uh, turning back to you, Magnus, we have a question from Melissa Lassell, uh, an MPP student at Mills College in Oakland. And she's asking, was there any geo analysis on the disparity of stops that might also show if some areas were patrolled less or more? No, in this report, we, we are not looking at that, uh, the disparity in the likelihood of being stopped. Um, that's, it, it's obviously, it's a very important issue and, and something that uh, research should uh, embark on and, and explore as well. There's some challenges in trying to answer those questions. And that's really in order to determine if a group is overrepresented, a, a, a racial or ethnic groups, to what extent they're overrepresented, is to have a good sense of uh, what that base is. What, what are you comparing to there? Is it the broader residential population? If one simply focus on the residential population uh, and the demographics of, of uh, that residential population, then it has a lot of, say, tourists, for example, then uh, that might not be the, uh, the best base. There are complications with doing that, but by no means am I saying that that's not important. It's just a, maybe an arguably more challenging to answer that than what we are doing in this report. But thanks for that great question. And there's another follow-up question um, from Dan at Goldman School Magnus, which I think you may have answered in that answer, uh, in the answer to that question, but he's asking, are these raw numbers of uh, whites, blacks, or, are somehow normalized by the population and if normalized, how? Well, thanks. I think for, for giving us an opportunity to clarify that. Uh, we're not normalizing uh, anything here because we are looking at the likelihood of a particular uh, outcome given that the individual has been stopped. So it's just given that you've been stopped, what is then the likelihood that you're being searched? What is the likelihood that you are experiencing an intrusive action? And what is the likelihood then that you're being stopped that there is some enforcement? And on the uh, discovery rate, it says, given that you have been stopped and you've been searched, uh, what is the likelihood that you uh, find something? So we're really focusing on, on differences in the, in the likelihoods here. And it has that advantage that uh, we don't need to make those normalizations here. Thanks, Dal. Yeah, thank you for that clarification, Magnus. Um, going back to you, Deepak, um, our next audience question is, your report discusses the interplay between different sources of data and what they can and can't tell us. What are some of the most important ways that data collection by the public sector could further increase transparency? Yeah, it's a great question. Thank you for it. Um, so it, it, it relies very closely with some of the recommendations from the report. We'd really like to see um, the use of force data be expanded to include all interactions in which a civilian was seriously injured. Um, and this particular place is in vehicle related deaths, primarily police pursuits, but also vehicle accidents. Um, and this is important just to understand the impact of various policies implemented at a department level, whether that's a no chase policy or an officer driving safety training. Now, obviously including things such as vehicle accidents. These are not purposeful incidents, um, but in the same regard, this use of force data has nothing to do with whether an incident was justified or not. And it's not an accounting exercise to assign blame, but rather to get a full sense of civilians that are injured in interactions with law enforcement. Other um, suggestions, again, could be re-highlighting creating the police mis a public police misconduct database so um, Senator Nancy Skinner has passed both Senate Bill 1421 and Senate Bill 16 that aims to address this by providing more and more police misconduct data um, through Public Records Act requests. However, it's pretty resource intensive to um, get information from individual departments to try and glean 
a full set of information on officer misconduct in California. So it'd be great if we could get a de-identified public data set from the Department of Justice. Thanks. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, we also have just another quick follow-up question from the audience for you. Um, looking at the first few figures that you showed, it showed data for 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019. And so the audience question is just wondering if, if that's the only years that the data is available for those data sets or if there's more historical data. Um, so for the use of force data, it was actually, it was a law, Assembly Bill 71, that was passed in 2015. So um, this is largely PPIC's first foray into police use of force and misconduct, but it's not from lack of interest. It's related largely to the effect of these powerful data transparency laws that finally allow researchers to look at a handful of years to tell us a little bit more about what we know around how often these incidents occur and the contextual factors that are related. Great, thank you. Uh, Magnus, coming back to you, uh, your report findings point to disparities in the intrusiveness of law enforcement stops, especially for Black Californians. What is the connection between agency type and the intrusiveness of a stop? Well, that's another good question. And yeah, no, it's, it, it definitely shows uh, a clear uh, disparity in terms of the intrusiveness uh, between black and, and, and white individuals. Um, so in terms of the agency type, it's, it really, what we are seeing here is that uh, there is definitely a difference between um, stops made by uh, local law enforcement and CHP. But we're not seeing whether it's intrusiveness or if it's search differences or um, enforcement differences, we're not seeing as notable disparities for CHP stops for traffic violations as we do for the local law enforcement. And, and we think it's, uh, you know, partly of that is, is a reflection of the differences in, in the mission where CHP is primarily, their mission is to keep our highways safe. Most of their stops are for, um, for traffic violations, about 99.5% of their stops are for traffic violations. Um, so it's differences in the missions and the, uh, the environment of, of enforcing the laws of California as well. Um, and at, whereas that context of making those types of stops in, in a um, urban area might be different as well. So we're definitely seeing those differences across the type of agency. And I think what it points towards is, is a need for uh, kind of better understanding what is behind those uh, differences as well. What are those, what are the roles of uh, concentration of crime, policing strategies and other things to, to better understand um, how we can safely reduce racial disparity. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, another question from the audience for you is, um, which you might highlight it on, in your previous answer, uh, you know, we only have uh, 15 agencies uh, in this data set, but do your findings point to any notable variation across different cities or different parts of the state? So in, in this work, we haven't looked at specifically trying to compare how are things looking in San Diego versus LA or versus uh, San Francisco or Oakland or Sacramento, for example. Uh, one could certainly pursue that kind of comparison and the data allows for that. Uh, we haven't done that, but what we have seen in this work is that uh, there are differences, regional differences and agency differences uh, that do contribute to the racial disparity, uh, that there are areas that uh, have greater racial disparity than, than others. What factors are behind those uh, differences in racial disparity across agency that we haven't looked at? Again, it comes back to this issue of what are the underlying factors for how uh, policing is, is being executed in the different areas? And what is the role of, of the uh, uh, crime and, and other challenges uh, in, in those uh, kind of situations? Thank you, Magnus. I do wanna just, Remind the viewers that uh, we still have about 10 more minutes. So if you have any questions, please send those to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. As you can see on the screen, that's all one word. Once again, it's ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. All right, we'll go back into our questions. And the next question 
is uh, I'm going to give both of you a chance to, to answer, but I'd like to start with Deepak. Uh, Deepak, the question comes from Allie, who's a student at USF. And she asks, can you elaborate more on policy recommendations you have or areas for future research? Yeah, Ali, thank you for your question. I think primarily for our report, um, because it was a first report looking at this and assessing the completeness and fidelity of the data, a lot of our policy recommendations are in that space. So one policy recommendation for DOJ is as it works to collect these use of force incidents, um, it can use outsized data sources such as fatal encounters to audit the data that they have to ensure that there is a more complete set where um, the incidents are relevant. Another policy proposal we had is um, when we were looking at the California DOJ's deaths in custody data set, um, we noticed a lot of those deaths are tagged with pending investigation as the cause of death. And currently law enforcement agencies are required to report these incidents within the 10 days of occurrence, um, but there's no statutory obligation to update um, uh, the incident with DOJ after an investigation has been completed, especially since these are deaths. It takes time for the coroner to make an analysis of what the, um, the death's cause was. So we'd suggest trying to ensure that there is um, a better data set by having law enforcement agencies report on that. In terms of future research questions, I think there is a lot. Um, as you could see from our work, uh, mental health is a place that displays prominently in these serious use of force incidents. So um, as California just passed Assembly Bill 118, the Crises Act, which provides pilot grants to community-based organizations to come up with innovative ways of either rerouting or um, addressing um, various crises, but particularly ones related to mental health or substance use slightly differently, it'll be important to evaluate how these effects um, change police use of force, public safety and racial disparities. And similarly, I'm interested in evaluations of local agencies that are working to um, create policies and procedures that reduce traffic stops. As we saw, um, that's a potential place where racial disparities occur and there's a bit more discretion. Um, so if we see reductions um, in those, it would be important to evaluate whether there are impacts on public safety um, as well as use of force and racial disparities. Thanks. Thank you, Deepak. Magnus? Yeah, I, thanks for giving us an opportunity to, to elaborate a little bit on, on these uh, policy discussions and possible uh, uh, policy recommendations. Um, I think what, as I mentioned, uh, when it comes to stops, it, it points towards a need for taking a closer look at stops for traffic violations, especially those that are made by local law enforcement. And I think um, elaborating a little bit more, a lot of those stops are, are directly linked to a concern about uh, traffic safety and road safety. Um, but also about one third of stops for traffic violations are for non-moving violations. So I think it's, it, it certainly points towards a, a need for a closer examination of possibilities of reducing those types of stops. Uh, I'll give you one example, and that is uh, a stop for an improper display of a license plate. Um, there are about 200,000 stops uh, like that uh, out of the 4 million in, in 2019. Uh, and there are good reasons for uh, making a stop and, and, and uh, trying to enforce the law for proper display of license plate. That's understandable. Uh, so it's not really a question of enforcing or not, I think. I think it's more, are there alternative ways to enforce these laws that do not involve a stop? That actually puts both the officer and the individual at risk. Uh, uh, so that's certainly something that we think is, uh, it deserves uh, more attention. Thank you, Magnus. Um, turning back to Deepak, I think uh, our next question some of the policy recommendations and future research you've given might, might answer this question, but I do think it's important that the question uh, is read. This question comes from the parent from a parent whose son was killed in an officer-involved shooting. Uh, 
He asked, how do we, together with all the stakeholders, change the paradigm in police philosophy and policy so that, sh so that shooting the kill is truly a last resort? And how do we create a code of ethics with the necessary legal recourse? Yeah, thanks for the question. It's, I think, a question a lot of us have been asking, especially over the last two years. Um, I think, one, uh, as a researcher, um, I'd like to motivate my uh, recommendations based on evidence, an evidence base. So um, evaluating whether certain trainings or changing the use of force standard. So um, a few years ago, California passed um, Assembly Bill 392, which changed the deadly use of force standard to one that's um, necessary to affect arrest, or sorry, uh, reasonable to affect arrest to necessary, especially when it comes to imminent threats to both your, um, a law enforcement officer or someone else in the community. Um, law enforcement agencies are currently undergoing training for this. And if it involves changing their policy or procedures, it'll be incredibly important to evaluate how this affects use of force going forward. And um, if it ends up being effective, it's something other states could look to. And if it doesn't, we can look at other legislation as a potential policy avenue. If you don't mind, Brandon, if you uh, yeah, let no, me add ahead, some, no, no. something to that. First of all, I, you know, I'm sorry for your loss of your, your son. Uh, Terribly sorry for it for that, of course. Um, you know what we're our our efforts here are really around, as 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 Deepak is saying, is on on the role of of research and data to improve these kind of conditions and situations to avoid unnecessary uh, hurt and and death as well. And we think that it's the key to that is that there is available data and transparency in, in these issues so that it can be evaluated and we can determine where we can uh, find room for effective improvement that makes it safer for, for both uh, our citizens as well as our officers. So uh, thanks for your questions and thanks for, for being here uh, today. And, and again, I'm, I'm terribly sorry for, for your loss. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thank you, Deepak and Magnus. Uh, we only have three minutes left in the program, so I wanted to give each of you just a, a quick um, 30 seconds or a minute to the sort of final question that came in from the audience was if there were there were sort of any surprising results uh, that you found during your work on these reports. Well, I'm, I'm happy to start off. Um, I, I think it's actually, when we're looking at the police stops and what we have shared with you here, um, I think it's, it, it lines up very well with what one hears. If you're talking to uh, communities of color, their experiences, it bears out in these data that there are disparities. Um, and it also, when one talks to law enforcement, we hear about the uh, challenges of, of, uh, uh, of policing as well including the roles of the various contexts. And again, the, the data bears that out as well. And, and sometimes it is surprising that things line up uh, so well with, uh, with the voices and concerns and, and uh, uh, views that are, that are shared. So it, maybe that, um, it lines up pretty well with, with those uh, uh, voices. Thank you, Deepak, and sorry to, or thank you, Magnus, and sorry, Deepak, to cut you off, but we've actually reached the end of our program. And so I would like to thank Magnus and Deepak for their presentations, and also for answering uh, all of the audience's questions today. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks again to our funder, Arnold Ventures, for their support. And thanks to you for all of us for joining us today. If you pre-registered for this event, later today, you will receive a survey. We would appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to respond and let us know how we did. Thanks again. Please be safe and have a great afternoon.